This is the Wellsville Fighting Squids Marching Band. Along with our fellow squid mates, we're proud to be in the band, even though we don't get too much respect from the rest of the school. The thing is, we just didn't care. I guess we were willing to sacrifice being cool because we love to play music. Besides, we were happy to be part of something bigger than ourselves. If you'd like to commission a knick-knack sample platter, instructions in the description below. I distinctly remember being a child and saying to myself, grown-ups don't understand what it's like to be a kid. They don't know what we're going through. And when I grow up, I'm going to remember what it was like. And I'm going to be the exception. I'm going to be the cool adult. I'm sorry to say that I did not live up to my younger self's expectations. I remember the experiences and emotions of being a kid. I try my best to be empathetic to young people, to encourage them and recognize their problems, and I try to keep play as part of my adult life. Heck, I've made my career talking about children's media. I try very hard to be the cool adult. But now that I'm in my mid-30s with a fully cooked brain and years of adult experience, I pay electric bills and feed myself and drive cars and accumulate medical debt, I can't deny there is a separation there. When I see a nine-year-old being annoying, I don't think, I remember what that was like, I understand. Instead, I think, this little person doesn't know anything yet and is being very loud for no reason and I wish they would stop. I have become a grown-up and my childhood self would be very disappointed in me. This is the real trick with media for younger people. Every kid's show is made by adults and you have to work very hard to bridge that disconnect between an adult and child's perspective. It's not easy, and I applaud every time a show gets it right. There is a bit of a cheat code built into this, however, which is taking that disconnect and then making it part of the story, a story where young people have to deal with the BS of grown-ups in their lives. Which brings us to today's topic, Day of the Dot, the second episode of The Adventures of Pete and Pete's first season. Originally airing on December 5th, 1993, directed by series regular Katherine Diekman, and written by show creator Will McRobb and Chris Viscardi, and Joe Stillman, who would later co-write the screenplays for Shrek 1 and 2. Best friends Big Pete and Ellen are both in the school marching band, which is a ton of fun. That is, until the band winds up as finalists in the regional championship and band director Mr. Markle finds himself in a position to make up for a past mistake. It had always been Mr. Markle's dream to win the state championship. Back in 67, he had a squad that should have won it all, but he forgot to cross the T in horned toads and they were disqualified. Markle's regrets and obsessions drives the band into exhausting hours of practice drills, sapping all the fun out of the activity. Ellen gets the worst of it when she's assigned the role as the dot in the word squid. The sports team are called the squids. And Ellen starts to take it very, very seriously. As the days passed, she became more and more consumed with achieving a state I am a dot. of total dot I am a dot. 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 This puts a strain on Ellen and Pete's friendship, and things seem to be falling apart. I feel this is a fairly common experience for young people, an authority figure putting an unrealistic level of importance and expectation on something that children are then forced to participate in, when really these things don't matter that much at all. We all know the little league dads and the beauty pageant moms and the parents who will take away your video games if you get a B on your report card. And as a kid, you go along with it because A, you're young and you don't have a lot of say over what happens in your life, and or B, these adults are authority figures and you're supposed to trust their judgment. Day of the Dot is a semi-remake of one of the early one-minute Pete and Pete shorts, simply called The Dot. It hits the same main beats, with Ellen given the role of the Dot in the school marching band, feeling inadequate from her authority figures and having a breakdown, and Big Pete stepping in to try and fix things. In the short, this comes in the form of simply being there for his best friend, supporting her in this sad little moment. There she was. I am a dot. Trying to achieve total dotosity, which is I tough to do without dot. an eye to be dotted, especially when you're holding a French horn. Yeah. So I went over to help. Pete said we weren't the best letter I he ever saw. 
but I had a funny feeling it didn't really matter. The full-length episode, however, is less about their friendship and more about a blossoming romance. There's this cool kid suitor that tries to step in and take Ellen away from Pete while all of this is going on, and Pete ultimately saves the day not by being there and supporting Ellen, but with a grand gesture where he hijacks the band routine during the competition. It's pretty hilarious how the announcer chooses to interpret things. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fighting Squids have just made a formation never before attempted on any football field. It looks like the sun. Oops, somebody pitch me. I believe they're going to attempt a thermal nuclear fusion, a force that powers the stars. There appears to be two heavy hydrogen atoms moving closer together. They're reaching a state of hot plasma, ladies and gentlemen. Please stay in your seats. Ellen, I, I. You'll have to save me. I know. And Pete and Ellen kiss and literally walk off into the sunset together. I'm not a huge fan of this. First off, this is the second episode, and the first episode with Ellen in it. And while we have had some shorts and one-off specials, this still feels super early to be pulling the trigger on any kind of will-they-won't-they they romantic tension. Imagine if Jim and Pam got together in the second episode of The Office. Imagine if Pam wasn't even in the first episode of The Office. It wouldn't work. And the show knows it doesn't work because the rest of the series doesn't address this. Big Pete and Ellen are back to being good friends in future episodes without comment. There are even the occasional will they won't they episodes in later seasons that don't bring up the kiss at all. Ellen had always been a girl and a friend. But finally, I had to know, was she a girlfriend? I don't know, Pete. I was pretty sure this was settled already. More than that, though, I think the short is a lot cleaner and more meaningful. The short is about a small moment of friendship and support that sometimes, when our friend is feeling down, all we can do is share the space with them. But that's still worth something. It doesn't solve the problem, but it makes things a little easier. The episode goes big and obvious with its ending. The short is quiet and subtle. While both the short and the episode are told from Big Pete's perspective, the short is about Ellen, about her frustrations and sadness. The full episode, instead, is about Pete, about how Ellen's extreme, harmful dedication to being the Dot is affecting him. It's not without its value, not without its good moments, but it's very much a girl as the prize story, a very stock television experience that the adventures of Pete and Pete usually avoided. It's an adult brain creative decision. It's not a bad episode, mind, just a lesser episode for this show. I haven't brought up the B-plot yet, which is a lot of fun. Little Pete is trapped on the school bus because the bus driver, Stu, recently went through a breakup with fellow bus driver Sally, played by Saturday Night alum Ellen Cleghorn. And now Stu is forcing the kids through a tour of memories, mourning that lost relationship. Over here on your left, that's where Sally dropped a scoop of pistachio swirl. I picked it up, I wiped off the gravel, and I put it back on her cone. It reinforces the adults dumping their problems onto young people theming, and honestly, it's a better romance story than Big Pete and Ellen. If The Day of the Dot had been a late season two or season three episode, and was the accumulation of Pete and Ellen's relationship, I probably would have enjoyed it more. If there wasn't a one minute version of this story that was somehow more emotionally meaningful, I probably would have enjoyed it more. It's worth a few chuckles, but it's simply not the best version of itself. Of course, we're talking about putting this episode into a larger context, how it relates to the larger Adventures of Pete and Pete franchise. And one day soon, we'll be exploring that context in full. But for right now, this was just a sample.